Order. It being 2 p.m., we proceed to questions without notice. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. Does he still have full confidence in the Prime Minister? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Conroy. Uh, I think my position on this is exceptionally well known. I have total confidence and support in the Prime Minister, and I will continue to have. Senator Brandis. Order. Senator Brandis. I thank the minister for his first direct answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Order. In, um, I refer the minister to Mr Crean's first press conference this morning when he said that the government had to get its act together. Does he agree with Mr Crean's comments? The minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, obviously, I think Mr. Crean indicated he was resigning. I, I didn't see all of his. No, no, I wasn't sure. I, uh, on his first one. Sorry, in the second one, I thought he had. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> so well, I, I was not actually watching his press conference. I'm just going on reports. But uh, order, I, uh, order, order. I do not agree with Mr. Crean. Order. 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 Just wait a minute. Senator Brandis is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. I refer the minister to Mr. Crean's further statements at his first press conference today that the government was in a state of stalemate, and in his second press conference today, when he said the government was in a state of deadlock. Does the minister agree with Mr. Crean's comments? Isn't it the truth that he serves in a government? which is disintegrating before our very eyes. The minister. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I take the interjection from uh, Senator Macdonald. I think he indicated that Mr Green had resigned. Uh, as I said, I, perhaps I was misinformed, but Senator Macdonald certainly is indicating that. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I clearly do not. This government is delivering programs like the National Disability Insurance Scheme. It is delivering programs like the National Broadband Network. It is introducing significant further reforms in education and has got an economy that is envied around the world. We have unemployment with a five in front of it. We have inflation with a two in front of it. We have growth with a three in front of it. Those sorts of numbers demonstrate this government is delivering sound economic management to this country. And those opposite who simply mislead day in and day out the Australian public, the Flat Earth Society over there, the economy at 3 per cent is flatlining. It's got no pulse, Senator Brandis has claimed in the chamber. 3 per cent growth, Mr President, and those opposite Time's simply— Time has expired. Senator Stirl, order. Senator Stirl. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Can the minister update the Senate on the government's review of Commonwealth fisheries and can he outline how the government is supporting the future of Commonwealth fisheries? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Stirl for his uh, question and his continued interest in uh, fisheries. Uh, last September I said uh, my responsibility uh, was to make sure our fisheries remain some of the most sustainable and best managed in the world, and that they served uh, by the best system possible. Today, uh, uh, I'm doing that by releasing the Borthwick review into, into Commonwealth fisheries and our response. Uh, Mr. President, the government broadly supports the direction of the Borthwick review, and I hope, unlike uh, cuts to research and development funding on all sides uh, of the chamber, can in fact support uh, this uh, reform. Uh, the review found that while our current fisheries management system is good, it could be improved by greater transparency, a broader policy framework by clarifying objectives and roles, and the job now for government is to engage with all stakeholders and the community to build an implementation plan for the Borthwick review. The review has made a number of recommendations aimed at strengthening uh, our fisheries management system, our legislation is now, Mr President, over 20 years old, so it is, it is time uh, for an update to reflect the changes in technology, in industry and community expectations. Uh, and when you look at uh, what 
Borthwick has uh, recommended in his review, specifically that the AFMA Commission remain as the independent authority to make fisheries decisions separate from government. Uh, I agree with those recommendations. One key area of consultation will be to include a broader ecosystem pillar to fisheries management. And of course, this would mean a more holistic approach to management plans. Uh, quite frankly, Mr. President, this is a, an extension for our fisheries to be managed uh, to a world-class standard uh, now uh, and into the future. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a supplementary for the minister, and I thank the minister for his, question, uh, for his answer. But, Minister, how does the review consider the role of the community in fisheries decisions? How is the government strengthening community confidence in our fisheries for the benefit of the industry? Order. Order. The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Stirl for his first supplementary question. The review has outlined ways to uh, better involve uh, the public into fisheries management decisions. Our oceans and our fisheries are public resources. They are owned by the community, and the community should have a say uh, is, and in what occurs uh, with them. The Borthwick Review has made a number of recommendations to increase the community's involvement and a confidence in fisheries. The government will uh, consult widely on revised objectives for the Fisheries Acts, enhanced public discussions and transparency by AFMA and ministerial oversight uh, for emerging issues. These measures should add to the community's confidence in AFMA and in our fisheries management system. Uh, I will, of course, be releasing the details of our public consultation process uh, after the release of the harvest and bycatch strategy reviews. And it is an area where I order can... times expired, Senator Stirl. Uh, thank you once again, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, thank the minister for that answer. Now, uh, minister, can you inform the Senate how the review has considered interaction with state and territory fisheries, and how the government is responding? The minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Searle for his second supplementary question. Uh, the Borthwick Review has recommended a Productivity Commission study into uh, state and territory interactions with our fisheries, and I will consult with the Assistant Treasurer on that proposal. It's important that we do, we do look through how we can encourage the states and territories to manage uh, the differing systems that we have. Uh, senators uh, would be aware, Mr. President, that some states uh, do have a poor track record when it comes to supporting our fisheries. In Queensland, the uh, Premier Newman's government actually uh, defunded its contribution to fisheries research and development, pulling out uh, 1.2 million in foregone research and development uh, activities. Uh, a shame for a government, uh, but it does sound uh, familiar. Uh, just like uh, the secret list from the IPA, uh, Mr Tony Abbott has a blueprint to follow uh, and say, uh, says nothing about an election, uh, then bring Mr Campbell Time's Newman's expired. style cuts Senator to Birmingham. bear. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. I refer the Minister to his repeated statements that he receives daily updates from NBN Co. I further refer the Minister to my series of questions to him since 26 February this year, where I have repeatedly asked him if he stood by the target of passing 286,000 premises with fibre by 30 June this year. And I also refer the Minister to his statement to the Senate this Tuesday that he was already seeking information from NBN Co about current targets. And I ask the Minister if, with NBN Co now having had days, if not weeks, to update the Minister on the viability of his target to reach 286,000 premises with fibre by 30 June, is this still the target of the Minister, the Government and NBN Co? If this is no longer the current target, what is the current target? And if the minister is unable to provide an updated target today, when exactly will he, assuming he continues to be the minister, be in a position to do so? The Minister for Broadband Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr President. Once again, Senator Birmingham seeks to misrepresent what I say and, more importantly, demonstrate a profound ignorance, a profound ignorance of large-scale construction projects, Mr President. This is this is probably because those opposite in 11 and a half years of government never built any infrastructure, never actually built any infrastructure. As I said yesterday, Mr. President, and perhaps I should spell it out more clearly, this is a national infrastructure project. 
NBN deployment information is, Mr. Mr. President, is vast, detailed. Obviously, you didn't notice that Wollonga is in South Australia. Never mind. Don't worry about it. I'll get you a map. Perhaps you'd like to visit it. You are a senator. It is technically, Mr. President, in Senator Birmingham's electorate, Wollonga, and it has had a, uh, a tremendous. I think, I think this week, possibly, Mr. President, Wollonga continues to lead the country in the take-up of the NBN and the activations in the area of Wollonga. I think it is approaching 60 per cent, uh, roughly, uh, last time I uh, was discussing it. But, Mr. President, NBN deployment information is vast, detailed, complex and involves, importantly, multiple construction partners. I have asked, as I have said, NBN Co for a full assessment of their progress towards their 30 June 2013 deployment targets. I am expecting uh, NBN Co to announce uh, new information this afternoon, very, very shortly. It is not simply, it is not simply Mr. President, a question of NBN Co pressing a button. I repeat, there are four principal construction partners that are involved in the process of these estimates and multiple subcontractors. My advice, as I have said, is that they are very close to finalising this information, Mr. President, and they will be making a full statement this afternoon. Order. We are Time's determined. expired. Time's expired. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary question. I refer to the Minister's comments this morning that the NBN Co will be refunded $2 million paid to contractor Synthio for workforce mobilisation following its handing back of the rollout in the Northern Territory. Given the failure by Synthio to connect any premises during the volume rollout stage in South Australia, Western Australia or the Northern Territory, why is the NBN Co getting back only 3.9 per cent of the $50.9 million already paid to Synthio? What additional costs will NBN Co face as a result of undertaking the construction themselves? The Minister. Mr. President, as I indicated in a press conference this morning, NBN Co is taking back the Northern Territory. It is taking back the Northern Territory. Uh, construction, and it is Cynthia will remain will remain the construction partner in Western Australia and South Australia. And taking back the Northern Territory allows them to continue to roll out and to overcome the challenges which have been significant of some of our largest construction companies in the country. Cynthia, for those who aren't familiar with it, is a joint venture between Service Stream and uh, Lendlease. Some of our biggest construction uh, companies, Mr. President, and they have been having some difficulties. So we are receiving back the mobilisation payment in the Northern Territory. I think it's around two and a half million dollars. We've made that a condition that that money be returned when we took back that project. When we took back that project. So order. In Time's expired. Senator Birmingham. A supplementary question, Mr President. Uh, on what date was the Minister first informed by the NBN Co Board or any director that NBN Co would fall short of its objective of passing 286,000 premises with fibre by June this year? Did the Minister have any discussions with any director of NBN Co or receive any information about their inability to meet the 286,000 premises target on or about February 26 this year? The Minister. Uh, I think uh, I think I first received advice following uh, the Senate estimates. Clearly, when the Senate estimates uh, indicated, and Mr. Quigley indicated that Cynthia were having difficulties, I think he revised down the forecast uh, at the Senate estimates. And I think you asked him a string of questions. And following that, NBN Co uh, went into further discussions and uh, consultations about where Cynthia were up to. So I received a letter from the uh, NBN Co board in I think, early March. I'll have to check the exact date for you, Senator Birmingham, which indicated that there were problems at Cynthia and that they were seeking to get more information and what remediation action they would take. And as I've indicated that the uh, the company, NBN Co, has Time's expired. taken back Time has ex the Time has expired, Senator Conroy. Time's expired. Senator Milne. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Is the minister aware of ABC late line footage of workers kicking, punching and bashing birds at a turkey abattoir in Sydney and that New South Wales police have been asked and that New South Wales police have been asked to investigate. Order. Um, order. 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 Senator Mill, order. Senator Milne is entitled to be heard in silence, Senator Macdonald. Order. Senator Mill. Thank you, Mr. President, and I regret that the coalition finds this cruelty amusing. I ask the minister, um, in relation to these acts of cruelty at the abattoir, is he also aware of this, this uh, latest incident is the most recent in a shameful list of cruel incidents in abattoirs, such as in March this year, with ex-racehorses at Laverton Knackery being beaten and dragged by tractors whilst still alive, and the slaughter of fully conscious animals in New South Wales abattoirs? Does the minister believe that these standards of treatment are acceptable in Australia? Order. The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Milne for her ongoing concerns around animal welfare issues in New South Wales. Uh, uh, unequivocally, can I say I am concerned by the unacceptable images uh, broadcast by the ABC's Late Line program uh, on 20 March uh, of mistreatment of turkeys at the Ingham Turkeys Abattoir in Tamil, southwest of Sydney. Uh, the Australian government does not condone the mistreatment of animals. Uh, the welfare of turkeys at this plant is overseen by the New South Wales Government for Food uh, Authority. Uh, this footage was uh, clearly unacceptable, and I will be raising it with the New South Wales Primary Industries Minister, uh, Katrina Hodgkinson, uh, because incidents of cruelty that are detected are actionable under the New South Wales Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. And the matter, as I understand it, and I think Senator Milne has uh, also uh, understands it to, to be uh, this, that it is under investigation by the New South Wales uh, Police. Uh, I always say on those instances that uh, it is best left to the authorities uh, to investigate these matters uh, and to bring those uh, uh, who have uh, uh, who, uh, uh, allegations of mistreatment uh, to the authorities' attention so that they can fully investigate it. Uh, I always then add that it is not a matter for uh, me to trample over that investigation, uh, but I do think, uh, like Senator Milne, that it was completely unacceptable uh, vision that was portrayed around animal cruelty. Uh, there are, uh, uh, I don't think I can add too much more at that uh, point. I can take uh, on notice and get back to Senator Milne, of course, uh, as to uh, what the New South Wales government uh, uh, may say about this. It is uh, well known that the New South Wales government uh, and states and territories deal with uh, animal welfare directly on, for domestic purposes. Time's expired, Senator Lappin. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the minister's admission that the behaviour uh, at Ingham Abattoir was unacceptable and cruel, does the minister now concede? that in order to ensure that humane standards of animal treatment are in place right around the country and to give consumers confidence that laws are being complied with, does the minister support constant CCTV monitoring in all ab abattoirs and does he think that should be mandated nationally? The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank uh, Selwyn Milne for her uh, supplementary question. Uh, it is worth uh, reiterating what I said in the primary answer. There are, uh, the New South Wales Food Authority uh, does have the authority to ensure that plant complies with the Australian standard and any importing country requirements, but it is responsible for overseeing animal welfare and incidences of cruelty that are detected are actionable under the New South Wales Prevention of Cruelty to Animal Act, and the matter is under investigation. Uh, in terms of uh, the broad issue around CCT uh, 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 surveillance in abattoirs. I understand, uh, Mr. President, that animal welfare groups have been calling for mandatory video monitoring of workers at all abattoirs. I do understand that the Greens, New South Wales, plan to introduce amendments uh, as well to the New South Wales Food Act to make it mandatory for all slaughterhouses to video the stunning and slaughtering of all animals. But these are clearly matters for New South Wales government. I will, of course, be raising it with Order the Minister of New South Wales. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, does the minister agree uh, that, uh, that, having equivocated for over two years, now is the time for the minister not just to talk to state governments, but rather to finally get on and establish an independent office of animal welfare? The minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, can I say at the outset the uh, the government does understand, and this is very important to uh, belabor this point a couple of times, that improved animal welfare is a crucial element of a strong and sustainable agricultural sector. Uh, no government has done more to improve animal welfare in uh, this sector than uh, the Gillard government. Uh, the government has this week noted a report uh, looking at the possible model of an Office of Animal Welfare. I will now uh, take the opportunity of examining uh, that report because animal welfare does remain a priority for uh, this government. I recognise that uh, there is uh, work to be done in this area, but the primary responsibility for animal welfare issues does remain with the state and territories. Uh, there are a range of issues that would have to be explored uh, in furthering any of those proposals. I don't want to go into the detail uh, now, uh, but it is clear that this government takes its responsibilities uh, very seriously. Order. We have progressed. Time, time has expired, Senator Cash. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, Senator Lundy. I refer the minister to the fact that five boats carrying over 300 people have arrived since the start of the week. Ten boats carrying over 600 people have arrived in just the last seven days, and 1,000 people have arrived this month. This is the biggest march ever for illegal boat arrivals, as well as the biggest first quarter of any calendar year. Why is this government more concerned with fighting amongst itself rather than fighting the people smugglers, and why are you trying to protect your own jobs rather than protecting the integrity of our borders? The Minister representing the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, Cinda Lundy. <clears throat> well, thank you, Mr. President. A, a typically shallow approach to a very serious issue by members of the opposition. We are faced with the fact that for far too long now, people smugglers have been able to peddle their lies and false promises, and that has led to far too many deaths at sea. The government's priority is to discourage people from making a dangerous boat journey and encourage the use of regular migration pathways. In response to the report of the expert panel, and I know the opposition has heard this many times before, but I will tell them again. We have committed to implementing 22 recommendations that puts in place a comprehensive approach to solving this problem. And in particular, we are committed to establishing offshore processing centres on Nauru and PNG, and we've announced that people who arrive by boat from the August 2012 will gain no advantage over those who apply for protection offshore through the regular pathway and increasing our refugee You're intake right. oh, from 13,500 to 20,000 people a year to create an incentive to engage in a regular migration pathway. So, Mr President, our message is very clear. Anyone coming to Australia by boat without a visa will be subject to the no advantage principle, including transfer to Nauru or PNG. And as the full suite of recommendations of the expert, panels, uh, of the expert panel are implemented, the government expects the business model of the people smugglers to crumble, and less people will waste their money and risk their lives on these very dangerous boat journeys across the sea. Real results will begin to show as more of the recommendations can be implemented. And I should say that if the coalition was really concerned about the number of people, they would not let their relentless negativity stand in the way of implementing all 22 Order. recommendations expired. of the expert. Order. Time's on my left, I'm waiting to give Senator Cash the call. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. A supplementary question. I refer the minister to the fact that a staggering 85 per cent of the 40,000 offshore humanitarian applicants were rejected Australian visas last year compared to just 9 per cent of applicants who arrived here illegally by boat. Why does this government persist in penalising those who do the right thing and persist with policies that encourage people smugglers? The Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Well, again, indeed, I totally reject the premise of Senator Cash's question. 
The issue here is that the coalition has an opportunity to support Labor's approach to offshore processing, and they can, have continued to fail to do that. We have presented the opportunity to the coalition to support. Just resume your seat, Senator. When there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator Lundy. We have continually presented the opportunity to the opposition to support our approach uh, to offshore uh, processing in Malaysia. We have continually offered to negotiate with them about the package, and that was rejected. In fact, can I remind those opposite that when discussions were occurring around the offshore processing bills, uh, that we were offered to sit down with the coalition and work out a consensus solution with them. They rejected that. They moved again. Why? Because they insist on playing politics with an issue that is costing people's lives. They are negligent and irresponsible in this regard. Senator Cash, Mr. Sen President, order further supplementary. on my left. Senator Cash is waiting for the call. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. Given it was former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd and former Foreign Minister Kevin Rudd who started the flood of illegal boats, and given it is current Prime Minister Julia Gillard who has failed to stop them, when will the government face the facts that changing the leader of the Labor Party won't stop the boats and only a change of government with proven policies Just that will get our borders on, under control will? The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Once again, the coalition seeks to make a, a, a trivial point about a serious issue. A serious issue is the fact that we do have a comprehensive plan to stem the flow of boats. We are absolutely committed to breaking the people smugglers' business model, and yet all we get from those opposite are pathetic questions relating to the leadership issues rather than the issues of substance. Why is that the case? The other, the other point I'd like to make, Mr. President, is that the coalition don't have a policy. They don't have a solution. They keep saying they do, but we know it didn't work. If they had the guts to support Labor's approach, we might see some results, particularly if they support our Malaysian offshoring uh, proposal and continue try to uh, actually find it in their hearts to work with Labor to see what we can do to stem that flow of votes. Senator Moore. President. Order. Order. Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Disability Reform, Senator Kim Carr. Following the passage of the National Disability Insurance Scheme legislation through the Parliament yesterday, what action is the government taking to now deliver that scheme? The Minister representing the Minister for Disability Reform, Senator Kim Carr. Uh, Mr. President, um, Senator Moore, thank you very much for the question, and I commend the work that you've undertaken along with Senator McLucas. Uh, there is no more noble a task for government than giving people with a disability, their families and carers, an opportunity to have a better life. And we have delivered a $1 billion in new funding for the first stage of the National Disabilities Insurance Scheme. And now that the legislation has passed, Mr. President, we will be launching uh, the scheme in five sites across the country from the middle of this year. The government is hiring staff and building offices in the launch sites. And about 26,000 people with a disability will benefit from this first stage. People in the Hunter in New South Wales, in Geelong, in South Australia and in Tasmania. And from the middle of next year, across the Australian Capital Territory. About 140,000 people with a disability will benefit from the complete rollout of the scheme across New South Wales by July 2018. We are establishing the National Disability Insurance Scheme Launch Transition Agency as an independent statutory body. And the National Disability Insurance Scheme will transform the lives of people with disabilities, their families and their carers. And for the first time, they will have the needs, their needs met in a way that truly supports them to live with choice and with dignity. This is a very uh, proud uh, achievement and it is something that I trust uh, enjoys the full support of this parliament um, and I trust that that's actually demonstrated as the scheme is developed. Senator Moore. Thank you, Minister. Can you explain how will the National Disability Insurance Scheme improve on the current support arrangements for people with disability? The Minister. 
Well, Senator Moore, the, I'm sure you're only too well aware of the great strengths of the, uh, of the new uh, proposal. The current scheme for supporting disabilities is, in fact, broken. And it is a system that, in fact, reacts to crisis, a system where families only receive support if they are unable to continue in their caring role and where there are no other options. A system that has uh, compared uh, itself to a lottery where even the best outcomes are in fact unsatisfactory. The scheme that government is introducing will work with families before they reach crisis. It will work with them to make sure that valuable <coughs> informal care that they provide is actually sustained. It will foster innovation services uh, that are delivered and coordinated by local people. The government solution is a demand-driven system of care tailored to meet the needs of individuals. A system that is proactive in approaching to Order. improving the lives Time of millions of Australians. Expired. Senator Moore. How is the government working with state governments to implement the National Disability Insurance Scheme? The Minister. Senator, through COAG, we are attempting to work with the states to deliver this scheme. But Mr. President, it's abundantly clear that some states need to get a move on. They need to match their words with actions. And they haven't shown them that it's a grass, how, grass the most important feature of this reform. And the government has written to the Victorian government at Christmas asking them to sit down with us, and Senator McLucas, of course, has done uh, the lead role in this area to ensure that there's a rollout across the state. Premier Nathine needs to do a great deal more than what his predecessor was prepared to do. He needs to make uh, yeah, yeah, sure that he signs up to the rollout of the National Disability Insurance Scheme across Pro Victoria as a top priority. And Mr Barnett, the Premier of West Australia, has signed on the dotted line at COAG in December last year to work towards a national scheme. And yet Western Order. Australia— Order. Time's expired. Senator Mason. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Tertiary Education, Skills, Science and Research, Senator Lundy. I refer the Minister to revelations that the government plans to cut its education councillor posts in Thailand, Taiwan, Hong Kong what? and Singapore, all who, play, all who play an integral role in promoting Australia's $15 billion per year international education industry. Given the government's decision comes after already presiding over a $2.5 billion decline in Australia's international education industry since 2009, why is the government causing even further damage to one of Australia's largest services export industries? Very good. Minister representing the Minister for Tertiary Education, Skills, Science and Research, Senator Lundy. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, a, review of the, a review of the standards um, Sorry. The international education sector in Australia has faced significant cha challenges over the past four years. The government has responded with a major program of reforms for the sector, including the Baird and Knight reviews. These reforms have strengthened the quality of the international education, increased the integrity of the student visa program and improved the competitiveness of the sector. Since the government announced its response to the strategic re review of the student visa program, Back in September 2011, 22 of the 41 recommendations have been implemented. And this has included streamlined visa processing arrangements for universities, introduction of the genuine temporary entrant requirements, reducing financial requirements for high risk applicants, and the establishment of education visa consultative committees. The government is currently giving a high priority to developing its response to the assessment level framework review and an announcement is expected shortly. The government will also introduce post-study work arrangements for eligible graduates of bachelor's, or, master's or, and doctoral or, degrees or, or in first. Senator Lundy, yes. resume your seat. Senator Mason. Mr. President, I don't take too many points of order, but um, Senator Lundy really is answering, answering questions related to, relating to student visas. This question relates to education councillor posts and not visas, sir. Order. I, do, I do draw the minister's attention to the question. The minister has 45 seconds remaining. The minister. Well, minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
I was um, hoping to brief the senator on some background to the broader issue. I'm not able to um, provide Order. specific information about the question he asked, but I'm certainly happy to take some advice on it. All right, um, Senator Senator Mason. Um, supplementary, uh, Mr. President, is the, is the minister aware that in his address to the Asia Society last week, Mr. James Packer said that the government can and must do more in China and Asia to promote Australia's international education industry and called on the government to have the courage to deliver on the Asian White Century paper by putting its words into action. Can the minister explain why the only international education roadshow for 2013 that's scheduled by Austrade, the organisation in charge of the promotion of Australia's international education industry, is just in Fiji? The minister. Um, the government is committed, uh, Mr. President, to supporting Australian students undertaking study experiences in Asia, and we have committed $37 million to Asia Bound Grants Program for students undertaking short or semester length study opportunities um, for Asian languages. Unlike the opposition, who have threatened to cull the Asia Bound Program, we recognise the need for not only more Australians to study in Asia, but for greater opportunity to build that experience around culture and develop skills and friendships, as per the Asian Century White Paper. Um, in fact, in October last year, we announced some $37 million of the Asia Bound Grants Program, which provided funding in the form of $2,000 or $5,000 grants for Australian students undertaking a study experience in Asia for up to 12 months. The funding to commence in this financial year uh, will support travel and living. Order. Sorry, in the Order. financial year of 2013. Order, Order. Senator Lundy, just resume your seat. Senator Mason. I, I did think the question was fairly specific and called for a specific answer. It's why the only roadshow is scheduled for is in, is in Fiji. Order. Order. The question was broader, but the minister needs to address the question. The minister has got nine. The minister. You listen to what I said. I said the minister needs to address the question. If you listen to what I say, you. The minister has nine seconds remaining. The minister. The minister. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Obviously, the specific question about Fiji, I don't have an answer to. But I make the point uh, that we have Order. invested thirty-seven Time's expired, million dollars Lundy. in the. Time's expired, Senator Mason. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, is the minister aware that, in addition to its current cuts to education councillor posts, the government does not currently have education councillors in the key emerging regions of the Middle East and in Latin America? This is despite the recommendations in the Cheney report for the government to increase and coordinate the promotion of Australia's international education industry in those regions. How can anyone possibly trust this short-sighted government? reverse the decline of the Australian international education industry. Very good. Order. Order. The, order. The, when there's silence, we'll proceed. The minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, I think despite the senator's best efforts in, in presenting his question, the fact remains that it is this government that is firmly committed to engaging not only in our region but to continue to build and strengthen our international education sector and how we promote that around the world. Um, the Asian Century White Paper um, spent a great deal of time emphasising the role that we have with our education system as an export industry, as well as promoting it within not only our own Asia-Pacific region uh, but further afield around the world. Um, Mr President, I reject the premise of the Senator's question, implying that somehow we are neglecting our responsibilities and our level of engagement across the world in this critical area of our economy. And you can see by the figures that it not only uh, continues to grow after a very important uh, process of, of making sure that our education system, our international education system, uh, has integrity and that people engaging in it can have the confidence of a full Time's fledged expired, tertiary Senator qualification. Lundy. Senator Xenophon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Conroy, representing the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities. Uh, Mr. President, yesterday I asked a series of questions in relation to a $265 million funding announcement back in October last year to support the Riverland and other river communities in South Australia. I am grateful for the written response from the Minister I received earlier today. Further to that response, does the government acknowledge that this fund needs to be tailored for the region for which it is allocated, 
namely river communities in South Australia, and that of necessity funding criteria should consider the early adoption of water saving technologies by South Australian irrigators. The Minister representing the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities, Senator Conroy. <laughs> thank you, Mr. President. And could I thank Senator Zenefon for his follow up? Uh, as uh, the Senator indicated, he asked a number of questions uh, yesterday, and uh, the uh, Minister Burke has supplied me with the following information. Uh, the Commonwealth has committed $1.2 million to the South Australian Government to undertake a feasibility study and to develop a business case for the River Murray Improvements Program. In accordance with this agreement, South Australia was required to submit by 21 December 2012 a draft business case that met milestone requirements specified in the business case funding agreement. On 21 December 2012, the Commonwealth received, for discussion purposes, part of what was described by South Australian officials as a preliminary draft business case for the $180 million River Murray Improvement Program, with further material provided by South Australia on 10 and 17 January of 2013. Further detail was sought from South Australia. Discussions on requirements continued between South Australia and Commonwealth officials during January and February 2013. South Australia submitted a partial draft business case to the Commonwealth on the 28th of February 2013, with other material provided on the 1st of March Order. 2013. Order. Senator Conroy. Senator Xenophon. Resume your seat, Senator Conroy. Senator Xenophon is on his feet. Senator uh, Xenophon. Senator Conroy is just reading from the answer he provided my office several hours ago. There are fresh questions that I asked. Uh, order. There is no point of order there. Sen Senator Conroy. That, uh, Senator Xenophon may have seen this. But uh, it does not have broader, uh, broader knowledge, and I'll add further information as we go. As I was saying, the Commonwealth provided South Australia with feedback on the draft business case on March 14. South Australia is continuing to develop the business case. These are significant projects that need a large amount of detail and clear governance arrangements. Negotiation on such projects can take time. And once a final business case is submitted for the RMIP, Commonwealth due diligence assessment will be conducted. Following due diligence assessment, a recommendation will be provided to the Minister for Sustainability, Environment, Water, Population and Communities, including on any conditions required for the program to proceed, if approved. If approved, a funding agreement will be put in place with the South Order. Australian Government. Time's expired. S Senator Senefon. My supplementary is that given that $240 million of this fund is meant to return 40 gigalitres of water to the environment, Will the Commonwealth be as innovative with the rules governing the fund as they are in asking river communities in South Australia to be innovative in their approach to optimising water use? For instance, will funding be allocated to projects that assist economies of scale and new tertiary processing facilities? The, the Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr President. As has been indicated, the $265 million commitment has two components the $180 million RMIP and $85 million for a separate South Australia Industry Futures Program. The spoke and content of the latter initiative is still being developed by South Australia. Funding for these programs will flow as and when the programs pass due diligence and are approved for funding and the required funding agreements. As to whether or not uh, they will take into account the matters raised by Senator Xenophon, I am happy to take that and any other parts of his questions that uh, I don't have any information on notice and see if the minister has some further information for you. Senator Xenophon. Final supplementary. Does the government acknowledge the fear of many in river communities in South Australia that this $265 million fund may go the same way as the PIPSA Water Infrastructure Fund, which has such restrictive, unsuitable and poorly targeted guidelines for funding, with the effect that after over four years only $14 million of $110 million in the fund has been allocated. Order. The Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll, seek, uh, I'll take that on notice and seek any further information. Um, Senator Betts. I seek, leave to move, I seek leave to move a motion that the Senate declares that it has no confidence in the government's ability to govern itself. So leave granted. Sleeve. Sleeve granted. Uh, I, order. Is sleeve granted? 
No, order is not granted. Uh, I leave us. I, I didn't hear the answer. Sorry. Sen, sen, wait a minute, Senator Betts. I'll give you the call properly. You're entitled to be heard in silence. You know, you know. Order. Senator Betts. Pursuant to contingent notice, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion that the Senate declare that it has no confidence in the government's ability to govern itself. Mr President, just moments ago, the House of Representatives voted 73 to 71 to suspend standing orders to allow a motion of this nature to be debated, but unfortunately, on a technicality, it could not proceed. It would be fair to say, Mr. President, Mr. President, it would just be wait, fair to say, Mr. President, that Australia has never suffered from a more dysfunctional government. Those of us that are old enough can remember the Whitlam debacle. And of course, more recently in our memory, we remember the Rudd debacle. But on top of those two, there is that crowning glory known as the Gillard government. And this Gillard government, if you recall, had to be installed because Mr Rudd and Labor had lost control of our borders couldn't deliver a surplus and had to get the carbon tax better down. Remember all those reasons that you needed a change of leadership for this country. And what a rich irony, yet very, very sad, that a day in our nation's history that should be devoted to National Harmony Day, that should be set aside for the consideration of the national apology to those impacted by forced adoptions should have all that pushed aside by the bloodlust of those opposite in their own internal machinations. No discussion about the cost of living pressures, no discussion about border protection, no genuine discussion about the issues facing the people who were confronted by forced adoptions. What we have is Mr Crean, ministers everywhere, going out leaking, holding press conferences, saying that they want to get rid of the Prime Minister. That is a matter for those opposite to determine, and I believe that they will ultimately make that determination later on today. But, Mr President, as the fundamental issues confronting our nation are being needed to be addressed, Labor is self-absorbed, Labor is self-indulgent in talking about itself, talking about positions, who's going to get what, when, where and how, rather than what is in the best interests of our nation. Indeed, the revolving door on leadership by Eddie O'Bead seems to have hit Canberra big time. It seems as though the dysfunctional Rudd government needed to be replaced by the dysfunctional Gillard government, only to be re-replaced by the dysfunctional Rudd government. Where is Senator Bob Carr when you need him? But look, there is no talk. There is no talk about the people's welfare, cost of living, our nation's future. All we have is this ugly talk, self-indulgent talk about leadership. And the man that fronted the TV cameras immediately after the national apology had this to say about Mr Rudd. He can't be Prime Minister again. Oh, I forgot. That was only 12 months ago. Today, supposedly, he can be Prime Minister. Indeed, the member for Bendigo said only a psychopath with a giant ego would line up again. And Mr Burke and the stories that were around, and listen to this, and the stories that were around of the chaos, of the temperament, of the inability to have decisions made, they are not stories. They were fact, according to one of Ms Gillard's cabinet ministers. Now I ask the Senate, I ask the Australian people, was the dysfunction of the Rudd government bad? Absolutely. It was, and Mr Burke nailed it with those comments. But it does beg a, beg a further question, which is, is Australia in better shape today 
than she was under Kevin Rudd's leadership. And whilst Kevin Rudd's leadership you, you was need dysfunctional, to to people by whilst their Kevin title, Rudd's leadership, by their t correct title, and whilst Mr place. Rudd's leadership was dysfunctional, in comparative terms, it was a beacon of light to Ms Gillard. Mr President, this is an important occasion for our nation. This is a government that is in disarray. It is dysfunctional. It is no longer serving the needs of the Australian people, and the Senate should express an opinion. Order. Order. Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr President. Well, another cheap stunt from those opposite. They have the opportunity, Mr President, to ask ministers at the table questions. And what are they reduced to? They don't want to ask a question in question time about the 71,500 new jobs created in this economy in February, the highest since July 2000. They don't want they don't want to, Mr. President. They don't want to ask about the growth in the December quarter of the economy at 3.1 per cent compared to the 10-year average of 3 per cent. Mr. President, they don't want to ask a question about the low unemployment rate of 5.4 per cent, well below the OECD average, Mr. President, of 8 per cent. They do not want to talk about the 900,000 jobs created since Labor came to office, despite, Mr President, 28 million jobs lost worldwide. Mr President, they don't want to ask a question about the inflation rate at 2.2 per cent, below the 10-year average of 2.8 per cent. And, Mr President, they have a chance today to ask about the cash rate, the interest rate cash rate, sitting at 3 per cent lower lower, Mr President, than any time during the Howard government. And that was the government that went to an election promising there will always be lower interest rates under the Liberal Party. Well, the interest rates today are lower than any time during the previous Howard government. And, Mr President, Mr. President we have the LaRouche Economics faction down in the far corner, Senator Barnaby Joyce, who wants to talk about debt. He wants to talk about debt all the time. Let's talk about debt. Let's talk about uh, net debt, Mr President. Let's talk about net debt. But no, he just wants to try and fudge the numbers, show that he can do the job by fudging the numbers, and he got sacked. He got sacked because he couldn't manage to describe any economic rationalist position. So the debt we have in this country, Mr President, net debt, net debt, as a percentage of GDP peaking around one tenth, one tenth of major advanced economies. And yet those opposite, particularly the LaRussian economic faction down in the corner, who think that debt references to Greece, talks about Greece all the time, walks out, does a store stop, oh no, that's Greece, that's Greece here. Well, Mr. President, one tenth, one tenth of the level across major advanced economies. And Mr President, do we get a question today about the AAA credit rating that we have from all three ratings agencies? Something, something, Mr President, those opposite were never, never able to achieve. Not everyone, Mr President, is on easy street. Not everyone, Mr President. There are patchy conditions due to factors like the high dollar factors like changing consumer patterns and ongoing global challenges, Mr President. But, Mr President, the global economy is changing. Technology is changing. And we can and should grasp the jobs and the opportunities that these changes will create. Mr President, the Gillard government is getting on with the job of addressing the real issues facing Australians. Mr President, that's why we are building the national broadband network. Just this morning, Mr. President, I demonstrated a brand new cutting edge technology developed by the CSIRO in conjunction with the Australian Museum. And what did they have to say, Mr. President? What did we have to demonstrate? An extraordinary educational tool for every child in Australia. For every child in Australia. You can now take a tour 
of the museum here in Canberra, no matter where you live. You do, of course, need one thing: a lot, a lot of bandwidth, a lot of bandwidth. And, Mr. President, Mr. President, that bandwidth can't be delivered on a piece of copper. Access to education services, access to health services, shouldn't be determined by how close you live to an exchange or, under the opposition's failing plan, how close you live to an ode. The copper in the ground cannot deliver the next generation of health services, of aged care services, of disability services or on, or on Order, educational services, expired. Mr President. Time has expired. Senator Mill. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, uh, earlier today the whole nation was looking at our parliament. And the whole nation, the whole nation, was actually, for once, quite proud of its parliament. I would have thought, because this morning we had a highly, we had a highly significant order. Mr. Uh, order. On my left, Senator Milne is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Milne. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. President. This morning, the whole nation would have been proud of this parliament because the apology, uh, because of forced adoptions, meant so much to so many people. There were at least 800 to 1,000 people here in the Great Hall and around the country, many hundreds of thousands more, watching, reflecting, thinking about what had happened and being, for once, given some leadership from the parliament across all parties saying we are sorry we care and i think it is really uh, a, a very sad thing that the apology this morning is now being overshadowed by stunts such as this and by the behavior <laughs> by the behavior that by the behavior that is uh, Senator Mill, Senator Mill, just re resume your seat Order. 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 <laughs> Senator Milne is entitled to be heard in silence on my left. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. As I said, that the dignity of the occasion and the day has been overshadowed by events which have taken on subsequently, and particularly by the behaviour here, the disruption of question time, and indeed Senator Joyce waving bye-bye, reminiscent, reminiscent of that children's program. Andy is waving bye-bye, and it's Senator Joyce who is doing that right now and behaving in such a manner. Uh, as only would be recognised by those who are familiar with children's TV. Uh, Mr President, I think, I think there are many things which need to be discussed in the national interest. The Greens have serious questions to ask of the government, and if the coalition has no intention of asking questions, then we are quite up to the task of continuing to ask questions. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, the motion that Senator Abetz has moved is the most serious motion that a parliament can consider. That is a motion to enable a discussion on whether the government continues to have the confidence of the parliament. And it tells you everything you need to know, Mr President. It tells you everything you need to know about the flippancy about the contempt for the institution of parliament by the leader of the government, Senator Conroy, and the leader of the Greens, Senator Milne, that they would characterise the most important business that can just, ever just, be just brought wait a minute, to a Senator parliament. Bra Senator Brandis, you are in, on my left and on my right, the other end of the chamber. Senator Brandis is entitled to be heard in silence. Thank you, Mr. President. That they would characterise the most important, the most solemn motion that can ever be considered by this chamber as a stunt. Because, Mr. Deputy President, it wasn't the opposition, it wasn't Senator Abetz or Mr. Tony Abbott 
who called a press conference in the mural hall two hours ago to declare that this government was so riven, this government was so dysfunctional, in such disarray, that Mr Simon Crean, an elder statesman of the Australian Labor Party, a former leader of the Australian Labor Party, a senior member of Ms Gillard's cabinet, called for there to be a party room ballot, which I understand there will be in an hour and a half's time, to terminate the Prime Ministership of Julia Gillard. And furthermore, Mr President, not 20 minutes ago there occurred on the floor of the House of Representatives an event with few precedents in Australian political history when a motion moved by the opposition was, was a motion moved by the opposition received 73 affirmative votes and 71 negative votes with Mr Oakeshott and Mr Windsor the two, and Mr Wilkie, but in particular Mr Oakeshott and Mr Windsor, the people who have kept this government in being for three tawdry years, decided that even they had had enough, even they had had enough, so they voted with the opposition. And the government was defeated by 73 votes to 71. Now, Mr Deputy President, now, Mr. Deputy President as you know, under House of Representatives standing orders, a motion of that kind requires an absolute majority of members to pass it, and therefore, because 76 people didn't vote for the motion, it was not passed. But nevertheless, the government was defeated, and it is the first time, Mr. President, since the fall of the government of Stanley Melvin Bruce in September 1929 that a government has been defeated on a substantive issue on the floor of the House of Representatives. Now, Mr Deputy President, we have in our democracy a way of resolving these disputes. It is called an election. If Mr Tony Windsor and Mr Andrew Wilkie and Mr Rob Oakeshott, who have kept this government in power, have at last said to, the, to, to their constituents and to the Australian people, even we have had enough, then wouldn't you think out of decency, out of self-respect, the ministers who remain in this government would say, well, it's about time we let the people choose. Yeah. Our government has lost the confidence of the House of Representatives. Yeah. It's lost the confidence of the people who agreed to support it and sustain it in office. Let us now and, it, and the Prime Minister has lost the confidence of senior minister after senior minister. Not just Mr Simon Crean, but she doesn't have the confidence of Senator Kim Carr. She doesn't have the confidence of Senator Penny Wong, who's sold her out for 30 pieces of silver. So we have a, a, a situation now in which the government is split wide open, in disarray, and whatever the outcome of this ballot, coincidentally an outco a ballot being held on on the 50th anniversary to the day of the famous faceless men photograph outside the Kingston Hotel on the 21st of March 1963. Whatever the result of the ballot today, Mr President, the faceless men will have made the call. The fact that there are two sides of faceless men in a faceless civil war against each other doesn't change the fact that the faceless men have made the call. They got rid of Kevin Rudd. They're getting rid of Julia Gillard. Time to get Time's rid of the faceless expired. men. Time's expired. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Well, thank you, Mr. Pre thank you, Mr. President. And I think, really, in that wind-up, uh, Senator Brand has demonstrated yet again what this is really all about. What is really all about? This is all about uh, the longest dummy spit in Australian political history, which is the opposition, who have never, ever, have never have never accepted the result of the last election. Have never accepted the Se result Senator, of the, Sen of Senator the last Wong, election. Senator Wong, just resume your seat. On both sides. Order. Order. On both sides. On both sides. On both sides. I remind. I remind on both sides. Order. 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 
ora 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 Senator Wong. And if anybody in this country ever doubted that the Liberal Party had come to this place with a born to rule attitude, they just have to watch Senator George Brandish today as he lectured to us about why he should be in a position of power, uh, puffed up and pompous as he always is, but what he demonstrates. What he demonstrates more importantly than all of that, Mr. President, is this absolute view that they are born to rule. They are born to rule. Well, let me tell you this, Mr. President. We on this side, we believe, we believe in a fair Australia, a just Australia. And I was very interested uh, that, uh, Mr. Mr. President, that Senator Brander said that the motion before the chamber was the most important, most solemn thing a parliament could do. Well, unlike you, unlike you on this side, we think an increase to the pension was a pretty important thing to do. We think a national disability insurance scheme is a pretty important thing to do. We think fair wages and conditions for Australian workers and their families is a pretty important thing to do. We think ensuring, ensuring we have a strong economy is a pretty important thing to do. We think tax, tax breaks, tax cuts for low-income Australians is a pretty important thing to do. We think increases in superannuation is a pretty thing, important thing to do. We think increasing the wages for the low-paid workers who work in domestic violence centres and in social and community services was a pretty important thing to do. And the list goes on because the difference, Mr. President, Order. in Australian political history, uh, as was on display between that side and this side, Order. is we are about Order. the future. We are about the future. We are not, and we are about a just Australia, a fair Australia, a strong economy for today and for tomorrow. Se Senator Wong, Senator Wong, you just privilege. might resume your seat. Order. Other speakers have been heard in reasonable silence. I expect that to remain. Order. 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 Senator Wong. If anyone ever doubted that the Liberal Party are about privilege, they only needed to look at Senator Brandis today. They only needed to look at Senator Brandis today. Uh, my motion is more important than pensioners getting a pay increase. My motion is more important than fair wages and conditions. My motion is more important uh, than fair and reasonable tax rates. My motion is more important than superannuation for working people, and I could go on. Because what we know, Mr. President, is that and this at this opposition is entirely addicted to negativity, has an addiction to negativity. Senator, Senator, Wong, Senator Wong, just resume your seat. Senator Brandis, I remind you that uh, that is disorderly to continually disrupt the debate. Senator Wong. Uh, Mr. President, uh, those on the other side are utterly addicted to negativity. And when the country asks, when the nation asks for vision, what we get from those opposite is nasty personal attacks. When the nation wants policy, you can always guarantee you'll get pettiness from the other side, because those on the other side have always been interested in frightening people, have always been interested in scaring people, have always been interested in dividing Australians. That is the legacy of the Howard government, and that is absolutely where the Abbott opposition are. You are always interested in division and in lowering people's sights, lowering people's aspirations. Well, we have a different view. We have a different view. We are the Labor Party, and we are about ensuring opportunity. We are about ensuring Order. a strong economy, and we are about ensuring Order. fairness. Order. Order. Senator Wong. Order. 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 Senator Wong. Well, you only have to listen to the interjections, and, and people here might not be able to hear them, but just hear the nasty personal jibes from the other side. That's all you're up for. That's all you're up for. Where does anyone ever heard? Senator Best or Senator Brandis espouse anything that made you feel uplifted. When have you ever heard the, the Abbott opposition, Tony Abbott, Mr Abbott, when you, have you ever heard him lift the country up 
He only runs the country down if he thinks it's in his political interest. He only runs the country down, the economy down, if, he's in, if he thinks it's in his political interest. And the same is on display today with Senator Abetz and Senator Brandis, because, Mr. President, ultimately, Order. ultimately Order. this is an opposition who can only do one thing, and that is uh, attack. That is Order. the only thing this opposition is able to do. And they're still doing it, Mr. President. They're still doing it today. All they can do is engage yeah, no, no. in the politics of personal negativity and personal attack. This opposition will never uplift the nation. This opposition will never bring fairness, and this opposition will never ensure a strong economy today Order. and in the future. Senator Joyce. Much, uh, Mr. President. Well, just then, the member for Hotham, Simon Finlay Crean, has just been sacked. Uh, this government is now this government is now chaotic. It is out of control. Um, it is it is it is beyond contempt that the form uh, the former leader of the Labor Party. Uh, the uh, person who is highly respected has been sacked by a prime minister, which has, has gone completely and utterly rogue. The prime minister has gone rogue. The country is without without leadership. It is chaotic. Um, we, we have, I, I look at Senator Conroy. The man looks like he's seen a ghost, and the ghost looks awfully like Senator Cameron. Um, it is. We have to do. We have. We have to do something about trying to bring some sanity back into where this nation is. It surely cannot go on like this. And uh, we know that there are decent people on the Labor side. We know that uh, Minister Ferguson, Minister Crean, um, I have to say it, former Minister Evans, former Minister Faulkner, there are decent people. But this chaos has got to come to a conclusion. The Australian people deserve better than this. You cannot use the Australian nation as some sort of plaything for a manic cat. This is, this is out of control. Totally and utterly out of control, and now we have um, uh, Mr. Windsor with Mr. Oakshot and Mr. Wilkie who have moved, moved votes of no confidence. Well, I told you so. First they would cripple you, then they would kill you, and that is exactly what they would do. Why on earth would you have ever hitched your caravan to, the, to those people? Because they have done nothing but drag you, drag you into oblivion. And here are the other ones, right beside us here, the Greens with their crazy policies, one after the other, after the other, after the other, one after the other. They took you on a trip on the carbon tax and destroyed your party. They took you on a trip on banning the live cattle trade and destroyed your party. They take you on a trip on so many social agendas and destroy your party, yet you let them do it to you. Why do you let them do it to you? Why don't you stand up for yourself? They, are, they will leave you nowhere but nihilism. And Mr Oakeshott and Mr Windsor, I mean, right from the start, Right from the start, they were going to be trouble. They were going to be trouble. But now we have what I mean. People are saying now, "Oh well, if we go from if we go from uh, Prime Minister Gillard, and I don't know where you'll end up at 4:30. Who would know? Who would know who will be the Prime Minister by tonight? And who would know how many more Prime Ministers this nation will have? But it's not going to be the Prime Minister that causes you the problem. It's the debt that's headed to Conroy. That's going to cause you a problem. $268.8 billion in gross debt. Um, we, we're, heading towards, we're heading towards our next ceiling. We're heading towards our next ceiling. Of course, Minister Conroy will talk about net debt, but he can't explain it. He doesn't care. We're just going through credit limits, went through the $75 billion limit, went through the $200 billion limit, went through the quarter of a trillion dollar limit. We're nudging up against the $300 billion limit, and it's the most tawdry financial Order management on my that right. any nation has ever had. And Minister Wong, you were the finance minister for it. You caused it. You brought this upon yourself. You brought this upon yourself. You are hopeless. You are hopeless, hopeless, and you will be marked. You will Senator be marked Joyce, by you should address people. your comments to the chair. It's disorder, Senator Wong. So, 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 Mr. You, so, Mr. you need to address your questions to the chair, and I'll ask you to be quiet until we have some silence in the chamber. And so, order. You'll get the call. You know, you know how this place works. When there's silence, when there's silence, when there's silence. So, Mr President, what we've heard today from the Labor Party has a very apt name, and we hear them all the time. We hear them at solemn occasions. They're called eulogies. We've heard a number of eulogies because it's all over. It's all finished. It's, uh, it's, it is goodbye to the government. It's goodbye to sanity. It's goodbye, it's goodbye 
to this good goodbye to Sandy. It's hello chaos. It'll be hello chaos at 4:30. And why did we do this? Where, where is Mr. Paul Howes now? We, we better find out. We better go and find out what he wants to do. We better find out from him where he wants to take this nation. We better talk to the Greens about where this nation goes next. We better find out that what, what would make Mr. Oakshot and Mr. Windsor happy again. What would I mean, they were happy with chaos, and they're obviously getting unhappy with the fact that we might fix it up. Now, it's it's. What's the next lot of chaos going to be? The NBN? Was it ceiling insulation? Was it green loans? Was it debt? Was it deficit? Was it the carbon tax? Was it the mining tax? Was it the live cattle trade? What was it that brought this nation to its knees under this chaotic and hopeless government? Well, it was the fact that we tried to join together three parts of uh, three pieces of an incredible puzzle. How on earth the Labor Party allowed themselves to be hooked up with the independents, hooked up with the Greens and hooked up with this chaos. How on earth they let themselves get to a position where they dispensed of the first Prime Minister. How on earth we get to this position right now. And this might be the last time I ever speak in this chamber. This may be the last time I ever speak in this chamber. But it is a disgrace. And our nation deserves better than this. Our nation deserves so much better than this. And I hope whatever you do at 4.30, you give some order, dignity back to this nation. Time, order, time has expired. The question is that the motion order. The question is that the question is that the order. The question is, Senator Wong. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to put the question. The question is that the motion move, Senator Joyce and Senator Wong. Order. Order. On both sides. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Betts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. Noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Abetz be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. Point Senator Kroger, teller for the ayes. Senator McEwen, teller for the no. Order. Order. The order. There being 32 ayes, 40 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Conroy. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice.